In this video, I'll be discussing bacterial transformation. Transformation is a technique which involves insertion of a gene or several genes into bacterial cells so that their genetic composition may be slightly modified. For this particular experiment, we do utilize a plasmid known as PGLO. Bacterial transformation is one type of three types of horizontal gene transfer in bacteria. Gene transfer in bacteria typically involves the transfer of genetic material from one bacterial cell to another, and it can be achieved through various processes. In horizontal gene transfer, we have transformation, transduction, and conjugation. Transformation involves bacterial cells taking up DNA from their environment, for example, through the utilization of a plasmid. Transduction involves a phage, which is essentially a bacterial virus um, that moves genes from one cell to another cell. And conjugation involves the direct transfer of genes from one bacterial cell to another through a pilus. And vertical gene transfer, on the other hand, is the mechanism in which genetic material is transferred from parent to offspring in bacterial cells. In the next slide, the diagram illustrates bacterial transformation bacterial transduction, and bacterial conjugation. And so you'll see in transduction, there is a phage present. In conjugation, a pilus is utilized. And then in transformation, we have DNA that is taken up by that bacterial genome. And in this case, we would utilize a plasmid to insert that DNA into the bacterial cell. Before going further, I just wanted to touch upon the central dogma of molecular biology, which states that DNA is transcribed into RNA and RNA is translated into protein. And so these two processes, transcription and translation, allow for DNA to code for protein. And this is relevant in this case because the ultimate end goal of our bacterial transformation experiment is to have protein expression in the E. coli cells. And that will be observable upon certain conditions. So regarding the protocol, I won't be going through the intricate protocol. Um, I do want to mention though, very briefly, this protocol requires a starter plate. Um, this is a typical sized Petri plate, which includes non-pathogenic E. coli bacteria. And not surprisingly, the E. coli cells, they are sensitive to ampicillin, which is an antibiotic. Through utilization of the pigloplasmid, when we actually insert this plasmid into the bacterial cells, um, this will allow bacteria to express green fluorescent protein later on, but only under certain conditions. So just as a note, the pigloplasmid is actually inserted into bacterial cells using a heat shock method and then an immediate cooling step on ice in order to integrate um, those genes in the plasmid into the bacterial genome. So regarding the conditions, um, the smaller petri plates that I previously displayed, those may contain either auger which provides nutrition. They may contain auger and ampicillin, and the ampicillin is important because later on it will demonstrate only transformed bacteria have survived. Um, so in certain plates, you may have ampicillin and untransformed bacteria, and ampicillin will inactivate and destroy the untransformed bacteria. Whereas in other plates where you contain ampicillin within the auger um, and you have transformed bacteria, those transformed bacteria will survive. And so ampicillin is one method to demonstrate um, the efficacy of your transformation process. 
And then we also have arabinose sugar, which, which is included in certain um, smaller Petri plates, and that provides conditions for fluorescence, as you'll see in the subsequent slides. So this kit is actually purchased from BioRad, and it contains all of the reagents and components needed for successful bacterial transformation. This includes even the bacterial cells. So the E. coli um, comes lyophilized, so it is in a dry powder form. Within this kit, we also have ampicillin, we have auger, um, we also have arabinose sugar, and then we have uh, the plasmid, as well as nutrient broth and transformation solution. Within the kit, we also have different components. So the smaller Petri plates, these are much smaller than a standard Petri plate. Um, for, the, for the starter plate, we use a standard plate. And then for the streaking of the untransformed and transformed samples, we use these smaller plates. So these are included in the kit. Also included are loops, microcentrifuge tubes, um, a package of dry auger powder, transfer pipettes, and solutions. So on the topic of plasmids, um, these are circular DNA molecules. Plasmids can occur naturally and they typically exist outside of the bacterial chromosome. In laboratory experiments, plasmids are used as a vector so that they can carry genetic information into bacterial cells. And when bacterial cells take up this genetic information, we call this process transformation. So in the image on the bottom left, you'll see the bacterial genome and then the circular plasmids. And in this case, our plasmid is named PGLO. Some supplementary inf information about the PGLO plasmid. So this is a circular plasmid and it contains three genes. It contains GFP. So the GFP gene provides instructions to code for green fluorescent protein. It also contains the BLA gene and this gene provides instructions to code for beta-lactamase. Uh, beta-lactamase is significant because it can inactivate ampicillin. So those bacterial cells which take up this plasmid then become resistant to ampicillin antibiotic. The last gene that's of interest is RSC. So the RSC gene provides instructions to code for the RSC protein. And this RSC protein is significant because it can activate GFP, but it only activates GFP in the presence of sugar. In this experiment, we utilize arabinose sugar. So in plates that do not contain sugar, this gene is useless. Something to take away from this slide is that the pigloplasmid contains three genes which possess the instructions to code for three different proteins. And that is under particular conditions. So typically towards the end of the protocol, two microcentrifuge tubes are prepared. The first microcentrifuge tube contains E. coli bacterial sample, but it contains no plasmid. In the second tube, you would expect to have bacterial DNA sample that includes the plasmid. So it would include those three genes that are within the picoloplasmid. And so essentially, um, this tube contains transformed bacteria, while this tube contains untransformed bacteria. So on the first Petri plate, you would have just auger. So Luria Bertani auger in this plate, and you would streak regular E. coli cells that have not been transformed. And once you streak these regular cells, you would expect to see growth, but no transformation. And so when you streak the same sample on the second plate, which contains auger and ampicillin, you would expect to see no growth. So you would have no bacterial cells due to 
the presence of an antibiotic. Now in the third and fourth plate, these are specific to the transformed bacterial sample. And this will only work out if you have followed the uh, experimental protocol meticulously and you have successfully um, caused those bacterial cells to undergo transformation. So the results you would expect would be as follows. If you streak the transformed sample onto the third plate, you have auger and ampicillin present. And what you would expect would be that beta-lactamase would be expressed and it would cause for these bacterial cells to become ampicillin resistant. And you would have bacterial growth on this plate. On the last plate, you would also streak the transformed bacterial sample. You would also expect to see growth here due to the expression of beta-lactamase and this allows for your uh, E. coli cells to become ampicillin resistant and so they grow in the presence of ampicillin but not only that they should also be able to fluoresce in this plate and this is due to this plate including arabinose sugar. So this is the only plate which slightly varies as it contains auger and ampicillin, but it also contains arabinose sugar. So not only will you have growth due to ampicillin resistance, but you should have fluorescence due to um, the RSC protein expression. And RSC will allow for the activation of GFP, which is green fluorescent protein. And you can typically uh, visualize this under ultraviolet light. So just to review what I've already discussed, upon streaking an untransformed bacterial sample on the first plate, this plate should contain bacterial growth, but you will have no fluorescence. Um, and this is due to um, no transformation occurring here, you know, no sugar being present within this plate. This is just a control plate that will demonstrate cell viability. It will demonstrate um, whether your E. coli cells are sufficient to just even grow in the presence of auger. In the second plate, you have also the untransformed bacterial sample, but you, you would typically expect no bacterial growth, and this is due to the presence of ampicillin. And this is also a control plate as it demonstrates the effectiveness of the ampicillin antibiotic. In the third plate, Recall that you've added plasmid here, and so you should have um, successful transformation within these two plates. So in the third plate, you would expect to see bacterial growth, and that is due to the ampicillin resistance that has developed within these bacterial colonies. Um, and this goes back to the expression of beta-lactamase, which allows for um, inactivation of ampicillin. In the fourth plate, not only would you have bacterial growth due to pre, um, the inactivation of ampicillin, um, but you would also expect to see fluorescence. And this is due to the RSC protein being expressed, and RSC also activates GFP in the presence of arabinose. So these two plates demonstrate fluorescence, and these two plates are observed in parallel as they both contain ampicillin, but this plate shows bacterial growth due to ampicillin resistance, and this plate does not. So these two plates were run in parallel. Just to reiterate what I've already discussed, um, these images depict what you would typically visualize at the end of this experiment. So on the first plate, you just have a bacterial smear on auger, and this shows cell viability. And like I said, this is um, just an untransformed sample of regular E. coli cells. Um, in the second plate, you have not only auger, but you have ampicillin. So here we determine that the ampicillin is effective as it destroys all of the untransformed E. coli cells. In the third plate, we have auger and also ampicillin, but here you notice you have bacterial colonies that have grown on the ampicillin, and that is due to the plasmid 
being successfully inserted into their genome and it allows them to express beta lactamase and it allows them to grow in the presence of ampicillin. So essentially it inactivates the ampicillin for them. In the final plate, you have bacterial growth in the presence of ampicillin, but also you have fluorescence and that is due to the RSC protein being expressed and the RSC protein also activates GFP, which is green fluorescent protein. And so GFP is active here and you can see green fluorescent protein as um, it fluoresces through a green color under ultraviolet light. In the final slide, I just have various Petri plates and um, different you know, patterns that were created.